know. Uh, he's author, speaker, supply chain attestation uh, for Unisys, Unisys Applied Innovation, Mr. Chris Blast. We're also joined by Eric Byers, the CEO of Adolis Technology, Ron Brash, Director of Cybersecurity Insights for Verve Industrial Protection, and we are joined by Brian Owen, Security Architect for Aussie Soft. Is it Aussie Soft or OSI Soft? I've heard a couple people say it differently. Oh, uh, we'll accept either, but OSI Soft is uh, my. Thank you for correcting me. Appreciate that. So we're just we're going to get kicked off here. We've had quite a few conversations over over the last few months um, with many different infrastructure sectors from transport to energy and beyond um, on supply chain. And we had a great conversation last night, actually, uh, panel session as well to end yesterday. And, you know, we, we keep digging in and digging in on supply chain. And really, we I think we all know that, you know, there's that that in that supply chain panel, we were we were talking last night, Jake Margolis, who's coming on later today, really good, really good uh, panelist and speaker was talking about how we had to develop a more resilient strategy, really, because we're there's no silver bullet. We're we're not going to get ahead of this. But what we can do is we can we can um, uh, we can treat our business as a risk then and that we're in the business of risk, as as was stated, and to make sure that we're prepared and that we're ready. Um, what I wanted to dive a bit deeper into is, you know, what we are doing to make sure that products that are entering this, the stream, the supply chain, are more secure and how we can work collectively to do that. So um, without further ado, I'll stop my uh, little rant here and ask, how do we better manage cyber risk throughout the development and deployment process? This is a hardware and a software discussion, I would imagine. So, um, Ron, will you kick us off? I know we've gone back and forth on this a few times already. Sure. I mean, I guess youngest go first. Um, so, I think there's there's three different perspectives here. Um, there is the asset owner, which which we're kind of, which is probably going to be most of the audience, and then you're going to have the, the the OEMs, the vendors, which I actually more more or less equate them to actually integrators because they're actually kludging together and gluing stuff together, uh, you, you know, buying chips off the off the shelf and soldering on the boards, taking board support packages, giving you, you know, all the features you want from ABC brand, right? They're integrators more than anything, just like just like Boeing, building aircraft largely. And then you have the suppliers that, that provide the components to the OEMs that, that they're doing the gluing together. And, and depending on where you are and where you sit, um, I think that's probably a good way to discuss to start this discussion. And, you know, there's different people here and we're all from different product backgrounds, but maybe maybe that's a good hand up. I just want to mention from the first point, we have, depending on which perspective you are, you're going to go down a totally different road. And, and maybe, you know, I think Brian had some great insights in his email, so maybe I want to pass it to Brian next, perhaps. Thanks, Ron. Um, no, the supply chain has been very much in the news now. Um, I don't know how many times SolarWinds has been mentioned. It's almost like the new Stuxnet, right? Everyone is talking about it. And we know that uh, it's like an iceberg. There is a lot uh, of work to do there. I think every software supplier has um, uh, really looked at what happened uh, introspectively to see what, what more we need to do um, uh, in our processes. But, uh, uh, Let's not get too distracted and um, allow knee-jerk reactions to, to carry the day. We really need to approach supply chain um, with, with facts. And, and that's, a, that's kind of a intentional pun for uh, Eric Byers and his fact program, but we really need facts to drive the decisions we make in supply chain. Um, it's just, going to be too hard to tackle this with, um, you know, a knee-jerk, willy-nilly kind of approach. I, I'm going to agree with you. Um, you know, I see people trying to do supply chain with spreadsheets, um, and, the, and supply chain is so complicated. Um, you know, we're never just dealing with the immediate supply chain. We're dealing with third-party, fourth-party, fifth-party, sixth-party uh, suppliers. I, and and I come at this from the perspective of, of both an asset owner at one point and then 
uh, chief technology officer uh, um, at Belden. And, you know, I didn't know um, as, uh, as, uh, as Ron says, an integrator of a product, but, you know, really building firewalls and switches and stuff like that. I really didn't know what my development teams around the world were, were integrating into our products. And I definitely didn't know what my uh, suppliers, what suppliers they uh, were using and what su sub suppliers they were using. And I think that's true. It's just really, really a complicated problem. And we have to um, start to throw some automation and some techniques to this to just rather than just say, give me a list of all your suppliers. That's not going to work. Um, it's it's got to be something that we uh, build up um, a community and that we sort of automate all that technology together so we can get that information um, automatically, not uh, by uh, phoning each supplier and, and, and trying to um, ask them for a list of his suppliers. You think that may not work, right? So this, this panel is, is a great end to an arc for, for me because I got involved with James and the Cyber Senate through the ICS ISAC, which is being uh, rebooted for everybody who knows us, a lot of the folks here are part of that in the past. And it was all about situational awareness, in that case, threat intelligence, and how do we get communities together talking and sharing information. And now we're talking about, frankly, the same thing, but it's it's more situational awareness. You know, where do we get the information that tells us, as all three of you said, as Eric, you, know, you said a lot, that I, as the provider, even know what's inside my own stuff, much less anybody else's. And this, you know, the, the digital bill of materials arc um, started really late 2018. And as I look back at it, there was a, a panel at Cyber Senate in October, I think it was in 2018, where Marty Edwards and Tim Roxy and I could think a couple other people were on the panel and Gear, you know, you know, made the statement that there is no supply chain security, right? So we've been driving down this path for a long time, for you know, decade or decades, if you want to look at it that way. But in this period, in these last five years and three years, a lot of the things we'll talk about today, no doubt, have burbled up, have gotten a level of maturity where they can be actually used. And because I like a lot of these things, the things that bring us, people like us together for these uh, uh, events all the time, we can all see a future where we can't keep doing things the way we are. You know, each of us, you know, I as Unisys now, or Eric, this or, you know, whoever we are, in five years and 10 years and 15 years, if we have as little understanding of what's inside the stuff that we're responsible for, we're, we're probably not winning. So you can see the paths <laughs> and they're similar to each of the other paths that have happened in careers of all of us here. James, you're on mute, so I'll just jump in here yeah, for a second. No, I keep doing that, you know. I think three days of conferencing's probably killed me. <laughs> <laughs> so jump in, please. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was going to say, this is not just uh, a, a vendor OEM problem. Um, it really is an asset owner problem. There was a great quote that I heard the other day uh, from a, a, a federal official uh, who said um, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, um, uh, has struggled for weeks to identify how many servers it had even running SolarWinds software. Um, so, you know, and, and I mean, this can happen. You don't have to have a contract with SolarWinds to have SolarWinds software on your site. You know, anybody out there who's using GE products are, are, is highly likely to have SolarWinds components in there because GE um, redeploys a lot of SolarWinds. So, it, and that, that just, that change just keeps on going. So, as an asset owner, you want to know what's running on your plan for bad days like solar winds. You want to know if you're going to be impacted. Otherwise, uh, and, and this happens all the time. I, I see vulnerability notices going out and people don't know that, that those impact them because they just know who they bought it off of. Yeah. And as a, you know, as Unisys, I mean, we're the world's oldest computer company. We've been at this stuff forever. We make huge systems for banks. And to be clear, everything I say has been said in public forums, but when a customer like ours, uh, uh, like City, who's been working on, you know, the product development uh, issues, the CICD custody issues internally, says, we're going down this path, you know, the vendors like us listen, right? And the, you know, I like, I like the frame for this, this panel. There was a DevSecOps uh, podcast recently, because it's not about supply chain. It's about product development. You know, in a world where I'm developing products for banks or utilities or whatnot, 
what you know what can I do and when do I do it and what drives that change and there's a lot of things driving that change now the software bill of materials space is getting relatively well known it's in this sort of mid 90s firewall space where lots and lots of people are involved everybody knows you know everybody there knows about it the rest of the world hasn't really heard about it but they're all going to and it's relatively well defined and this this digital bill of materials attestation structure seems to you know be getting to a level of maturity where, where it'll probably go forward or something like it so you can start to see the shapes of how we as product developers you know meet the needs that our customers are going to giving to us and our competitors and you know what steps we go to go down that path I'm just going to call some people out because I feel like it. And uh, I know, I know, David Doggett, you're listening in. And David, you gave a fantastic presentation yesterday on embedded device security. And we warmly welcome you into this uh, stage if you want to join us. Um, sorry, Ron or Brian, were you, were you? No, 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 thank you. Actually, that, that's a good call out. So I, I try to look at this a bit differently because an SBOM, depending on where you, which audience you are, as I mentioned earlier, will change how you use it, right? If you're an asset owner, an SBOM on its own isn't very helpful unless you integrate that in, into your technology stacks and your processes, right? Like try to go to a NERCSIP audit for NERCSIP 13 and, and have a metric ton of SBOMs in front of you with no context, no new pieces work in those products. You see a Linux version that has a 700 vulnerabilities, but the reality is maybe only 100 of them are actually in there. 10 are actually applicable because those interfaces are implemented in a certain way. You know, none of that is really captured there. And only the vendor really knows what's going on and hope, well, hopefully they know what's going on. And, and they're just not, you know, uh, regurgitating what came from the, the VX work supplier upstream or whatever. Uh, so there's lots of aspects here that you need to carry forward. I try to think of supply chain, not as its own, uh, uh, domain. It's actually really an extension of risk management and vulnerability management. And if you look at it very pragmatically, which I'm, I'm trying to, to do here in that same sense, it's just an extension of all of the things that you have, just that you're given more insights. How you use those insights and what those insights are in is really going to be the game changer. We are, we are really still early in, in that, that infancy of understand or that process of understanding on where we are, how to use those things. And Brian can probably attest to how hard it is to say to people, hey, yes, because we use that library, it's not vulnerable uh, because we do A, B, and C, right? Like people are just going CVE hunting. This is really tricky stuff. And, and Eric mentioned, right? People aren't checking those, those data sources. There's too many data sources. Every OEM has their advisory portal now that isn't tied into NVD. And ICS cert is doing whatever it is. And you have Aruba products with a Siemens name on them and the, the, the CVEs don't match. And I know Oasis is coming out. I got grilled on that the other day. But that'll be it. That'll, um, you know, one more standard just complicates everything again altogether. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of pieces there that you need to glue together, and and it is a risk management exercise, right? Supply chain leads to understanding your risk reorganization or that set of assets, and so you need visibility. And I don't want to shameless plug what I do, um, but all depending on where you are in those three perspectives, everything really really changes and. And, and you don't know what your developers are putting in your products half the time, right? I mean, like Solar Winds. I bet you, if any peer, any even the first person that wrote the code, I doubt a peer review would have found it. I highly, highly doubt it. And Eric can probably say the same thing. So there's a lot of risks here, and you, it, it is risk management. That's what it is. Well, and and to define a couple of things for people, and uh, and use that as a lever to explain why I think this is moving forward. So a software bill of materials is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bill of materials. It's a list of ingredients, contents about a piece of software. And as Ron's just saying right now, that's great. You, you know, obviously you need those, obviously. Uh, next step, and you're going to get them. That train has left the station, you know, people on the screen and out in the world and in you know, public and private sector going on that path. Next step, what are you going to do with all those? Well, they got to be put in some sort of context, don't they? Because there's too many pieces. So you get these inevitabilities where, where people are going down the software bill of materials perspective, which sticking to our topic here, product development, means that developers are going to have to be formalizing their process but enunciating what's in something. And in dash Toto, in Toto is another Linux Foundation uh, project that gives you a taste for where this is going in product development. All of that is at creating attestations about the custody of the software you're developing. So now I have the final bill of materials and I have attestations about the custody. 
where 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 the digital bill of materials or DBOM structure comes in is a system of attestation uh, nodes and channels. We can talk about it's very like some other place, but that's where the attestations go. So that you know, close to the utility, you know, the the consumer that Ron's talking about, there's some set of channels where they can see things that yeah have been attested to by somebody they're doing business with or or already have a relationship with, and they can act on those. And then the vast sea of information beyond that, like threat intelligence, the huge number of S bombs and custody and handling and H bombs and M bombs and so forth, don't get all the, that far down because they can't. So, I, you know, I think you nailed it, Chris. Uh, to me, S bombs are just a tool that we need to use to to help the software developers make a better product, uh, understand what risks they've taken on um, through uh, third-party code they've integrated. And by the way, everybody integrates third-party code. Um, and uh, for customers to understand what risks they're acquiring. Um, and, and I liken it to a can of soup. I go to the grocery store, I pick up a can of soup, I see the ingredients on the side. Unless I understand what those ingredients mean, um, then they're just names on the side of a can. If the can of soup I have says includes um, monosodium glutamate or says palm oil, and I don't know what that is, is that good? Is that bad? Should I? Um, so unless you take the S bombs and then enrich them, uh, you've you've got really nothing. And but the S bombs allow us to enrich our knowledge about a software package and the risks we're taking. Maybe. Yeah. It's a foundation. Yeah, if I could jump in for a second, because I, I know, um, you know, a lot of things we're talking about. I'm imagining that there's people listening that are thinking, wow, this is great, but you know, it, it's not going to help me uh, with with my plant right now. Um, this this is it's almost like a control loop, right? We're we're way out here uh, on some cascade loop, and the inner loop down in the plant isn't getting any help, right? The time constant for um, new products getting into the field uh, that uh, maybe have been built better and all that is uh, is just so long. So how do we deal with the supply chain uh, issues for things that are in the field today? And um, you know, there's part of it, of course, is is understanding what you have um, and tools like Fact or Maybe some people have come across uh, cyber ITL where you, you know you can scan a binary and and tell whether it was built with even uh, the modicum of of memory protections uh, and and just try to get a feel for where the technology is in the security life cycle. Um, so understanding your assets better in the field. There's uh, there's also initiatives like uh, EPRI TAM is a is a wonderful one for not just looking at the bits, but understanding the data flows uh, that are going in and out of a product, help you understand that attack surface a lot better. Um, the, the AHA project uh, out of uh, Washington State University uh, is another one that is just super simple, give you a zero 100 score on your attack surface. So getting away from, um, guessing about what you know what the posture of the software is and and having more facts to help you prioritize um, you know where the issues are and how to act on them is important and the, and the last piece and I'd like to throw it out to the audience to comment is we need to do a whole lot more testing across the entire supply chain uh, there's some testing that is best done uh, early in, in the development chain and suppliers are doing that, but there's some that needs to be done at the handoff, uh, whether it's factory acceptance or customer acceptance. And then there's ongoing uh, testing that, that needs to occur as well. And the security research community has been, been great at that, quite frankly. They're, they're um, often showing us where, where we need to get better. So, uh, you know, what are we doing for the testing and how, can we, to use Chris's words, put those in to the, uh, uh, some kind of a uh, mechanism to share that testing so everyone's not having to reinvent the, the rule or reinvent the wheel, sorry. 
Dave's commented in the chat, if you guys can see that, then maybe uh, comment. All right. You know, I was going to use a, you know, since this is the cyber Senate, there's a great OT example of this is the business drivers. You know, sometimes security is adopted because security quite often is because competitive advantages are driving changes in, in markets. And, you know, since most of the world I work in these days is not OT, you know, everybody here knows how much fun it is to trot that out. You start talking about a plant engineer and a plant engineer using a, a, a real-time data system, a Unisys partner, we've gone all the way down the path with this, who can say that this last batch of materials coming in perform differently, you know, based on on the the, the, the source of that, that content. Um, to be able to, to, as a manufacturer, say to you know, the, the product vendor that I'm manufacturing products for, um, I will not ship any product to you that doesn't meet your requirements, like it's gone over a set uh, degree uh, of temperature in the shrink wrap tunnel. And having that automatically attesting itself into the same structure that we use for for, our, for the security purposes we care about. You know, so and, and the origin of DBOM was an internal Unisys conversation. It's like, look, we buy, and again, all public information, we buy from Dell, we sell to City. We don't need to solve the world's problems. We can just save money ourselves by being more clear about exactly what we're getting, exactly what we're doing with it, and exactly you know, what, we've, what we've committed to. We've identified multiple you know, annual, repeated, you know, expensive things that happen we can avoid. So we're getting into these sort of cycles where David, to your, to your, to your point, we have, I mean, S-bombs are pretty well done. There's a, in the US, there's an executive order coming out any minute now that's, as far as we can all tell, it's probably gonna say S-bomb. The US Department of Energy, uh, Citrix program is going down that same path and they're probably going to use the DBOM attestation structure, right? Just because they need to. And it's, it's where we have business values in doing these things that we as security pr practitioners can say, look, it's not just about being a good corporate citizen. It's about lowering our cost and reducing our, our customer support response cycle so that we can be more profitable and competitive. Executives like that, and they will give you budget to do your security things when you can say that. Well, David, I, I don't know if everybody saw David's comment, um, but I think it was really good. Uh, we can start to understand uh, how many and what components come into our code, but how do we get a handle on knowing uh, if you have genuine unchanged version of all those? Um, and I and I think that's one of the important things that, um, you know, all the S-bombs in the world would not have helped us on their own to, to find solar winds because that was uh, genuine modified code, you know, that came from the development center and it was signed. It was, um, but what the S-bombs allow us to do is to do uh, two things. Uh, one thing immediately, uh, they start to allow us to be able to say, hey, now there's a problem. And I'll go back to my FAA uh, example. Um, we know there's now some bad code how do we go and find it where it's deployed in the real world? Uh, and obviously the FAA didn't have a way of doing that. Um, and I think that's what we have to address is how do we know what you're actually running on your plant floor? Um, but the second thing that I think is really important is uh, once we start to get there, one of the projects my data scientists are working on right now is a counterfeit detection. Because if we have enough samples of what is legitimate, um, we can start to look at uh, what uh, shows up uh, either because it hasn't come through the development center, because it's been signed in a non-standard way, or because the code patterns and the compiler bits aren't the same. We can start to say, hey, I can't tell you for sure that that's counterfeit, but it is an anomaly, just like we use anomaly detection on networks, it's anomaly detection in software. That That component is anomalous compared to what I've seen come out of vendor XYZ for the last year. Well, this re leads, I think, directly into what you were saying, Ron, that, you know, once you get to that point, there's the now what, you know, where, where you're going, Eric, you know, so the now what is, okay, so I do know that I do have that code, it is deployed at that spot, my network, you know, and perhaps I also know that all the network ports and traffic that, that could possibly be used for that are disallowed by the network architecture right there, and that that is, you know, under continuous monitoring, and I would get a alert to my SOC if that ever changed for a second. So maybe I don't do anything about it, you know, but you have to have all those pieces in the stack. And if we're going to go down the S-bomb uh, path, and we are, then each of these other paths is going to follow naturally. 
and, and this is very, so not actually other stuff. I'll, I'll circle back on to David's question earlier because there's a lot to unpack out of that. And some of it will be beyond some of the audience's head and some won't be. Don't get me wrong. Like hashes don't solve the world's problems, especially on embedded hardware where every single binary will look different from another one. And there's issues around that too, right? Like how you compile for your Intel CPU will might look totally different on an ARM CPU, right? It, because of the different interactions of the hardware. And, and no S bomb is going to help you get that. Even a hardware bomb probably won't get you. Right? This, you're dealing in the land of errata. But there's another interesting aspect here too from a business driver is you produce build materials and do assessments pre-acquisition by large uh, by large organizations as a way to discern the risks before they even look at purchasing X amount of products. I mean, Eric and I in our previous life, Eric used to be my boss. Um, you, we, we actually had people show companies and buy our product and then we had to go deal with the assessment results in a past life. And, and you know, SBOMs would have been something very helpful there, uh, you know, even, even for our part to understand it. But there's a, whole, there's a whole world there. But for that customer that wanted that assessment, and actually we've done it a couple times, it gives them a big stick to improve the product that they're about to purchase or at least to negotiate certain things with the, the, the integrator, the vendor. Um, it's really, really powerful stuff to help manage your risk before you you have that risk unconsciously transferred upon you as the asset owner. And I think that's a really critical part of of how that pieces are there too. So um, that that's one piece as well. And then uh, the other piece I wanted to sort of unpack was on David's question is how do you know if you're dealing with vanilla or unadulterated code or unmolested code? I can almost tell you every you know, without a doubt that most of your systems that you run have patches in them and are not even anywhere close to what your original expectation were. Yeah, maybe libraries will be the same. Um, like for example, like how you would use like libzip or libssh for sure. But the Linux kernel, uh, anything that has any adaptations on top of it, if you've ever compiled stuff for OpenWRT, you will know that there's a 50 million layers of patches. They all get quilted together. And then you add compiler flags on top of it and all of these specifics. And it's, it is a very nuanced understanding. So when people say supply chain, this is at the current point in time, it's a thumb to the wind and vendors can use this as a way to improve their products, right? To get a smell test, uh, especially for internet of trash. This is very, very critical stuff here. Very, very critical stuff. So I won't take it over, but I just want to feed the, feed the rest well, of the I, conversation. I, I, now I have quilted together stuck in my head. <laughs> but to, to Andy's points uh, in, the, in the chat, what I find interesting as indication that we're on, an arbitrary path. This is not situational. It's not because of individual events. Is that we have a series of executive orders from two very different U.S. Uh, federal administrations that go down the same path. And the first one goes, you know, back to the regionalism uh, you mentioned, Andy. You know, the first executive order is was you know China bad. Um, you know, and 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 again, separate from personalities and administrations. At that point, it's understandable. I, that was the first public comment about DBOM is that. You can you can understand that need. Uh, it'll need to be refined, but you know we're going in this direction. And the new administration has an executive order out that seems to be reinforcing it going on the same path. We need to be able to say, yeah, you know, whichever country we are representing, you know, maybe there's another country we don't trust at the moment. We need to know where their stuff is, and that both allows defenders, you know, where those fears are real, to uh, behave better, but they also allow better cooperation because. You, you, you don't have to assume that everything from everywhere has everything in it. Yeah. And, and also too, I mean, Andy, Andy had a good point and ripple 20 or whatever your, your branded set of vulnerabilities are, um, they're in the source code and not the binary. So as I said, the vendors are integrators and they can apply their own patches. Um, even different compilers might even add guard code and make those irrelevant. Right. So what, what goes into a binary isn't necessarily what comes out of it. And fingerprints are one way to look for it. Like if they're symbol tables or stuff like that, right? You can get an idea. But if you scrub all your binaries, which is a security best practice, then you're, you're dealing with a whole nother can of worms, if you will, right? Your soup, your soup might not be the, the same ingredients that you expected. And let me tell you, you know, uh, there was some research done at CS3 last year and they were ripping apart a Schneider device and I was chuckling and I, I messaged the, the gentleman, the researcher on the other end and said, how many devices did you destroy and how many different variations did you get? And he's like, we had five or six different hardware variations of the same product in the same package, which to me also note means that the Linux kernel is using different drivers at runtime to, to deal with certain things, right? It might actually be the same source code, but the end result is different. And that's also something the FAA also struggles with, with error worthiness reports. So there's, there's a lot of things there. And 
the presence of a vulnerability in supply chain or a risk or an invulnerability does not mean exploitability, right? So I'll, I'll rephrase that in simpler terms. Let's say you have a, a, a vulnerability in Microsoft's remote desktop protocol stack, but you have RDP disabled. Are you really at risk, right? Maybe someone could turn it on for sure. I'm, I'm not gonna negate that. But are you at risk because of the overall situation? And so if you have other assets with RDP enabled and they're on the internet or in a place that's you know has more exposure, you're gonna target those guys first. And vendors will do the same things too on understanding which, you know, where the dead bodies are, the skeletons, if you will. And, and try to match around that, but it's, it's very complex. And the more we go to stack, you know, web stacks and all these fully featured ones, I don't know if you've ever seen developers say, import everything that I need in Visual Studio, they do it. Um, and they don't know what they're accepting. This is, this is the reality of, of where we're going. And we, as Chris said, as Eric said, uh, and that's why James brought us here and, and Brian could probably attest to how tricky this is as moving towards, you know, open source components and products. Um, we need to get a handle on this. Ron, thanks for mentioning that uh, just because a vulnerability is in there with it, it, it may not be exposed. It's, it's so important. And we, we have to also value stability, um, not just security. That may sound like heresy in a security conference, but stability is related uh, to, to security and, and the availability piece in particular, which is so important in ICS. So um, I, I really think we have to accept that no one wants to be on the vulnerability patch hamster wheel. It doesn't work in ICS. And we need to get smarter about understanding exploitability and having uh, mitigations that, that are easier than patching. And in, in the longer term, uh, you're exactly right, Ron. We're, we'll have to simplify devices. We can't be bringing in entire uh, web server stacks into every device. That's that's not going to be the formula for stable, successful software going forward. Just look at BusyBox alone as it's an embedded shell that has, it's, it's a utility knife. And I can tell you it's got FTP in it, it's got Telnet in it, whether or not it's enabled, it's gonna have DHCP, it's gonna have everything in the kitchen sink and possibly even your grandmother to go along with it. And, and we need to start limiting all of those surfaces today. I, I, I know that people will say, well, you know, like it's like when you buy a car, it's got everything, including Bluetooth, even if I didn't want it, um, it it's all there. I wish I had a choice, but uh, we need, as, as Brian said, we really got to start minimizing these, these solutions and really getting a handle on it. I mean, that was the great thing when hardware had no, had no resources because you were forced to, uh, to go through these processes and clean it up. There was a benefit, you knew what every little bit of code was doing. I mean. It may take many of the real-time uh, safety systems control microcontrollers, you and FPGAs, right? They weren't these commodity devices with a with a ton of RAM and shared. In, it wasn't there, and it, it is today for right or wrong, and it's enabling new sets of innovation and disruption. I, and I appreciate that, but <laughs> you're 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 letting yourself out. Just as like on the internet, you share everything. Well, the same as in a device. If you give everyone the keys to the kingdom. I don't even need to bring exploit where onto your device. You gave it to me for free, like I did in the SANS ransomware attack. So you got to start doing some due diligence there and having your developers be responsible and accountable for what they're bringing into your environment. And if you're not, you're playing a catch up game. And so again, I'll, I'll pass that off to the others because I think that's an intriguing point. Well, I, I you know, given our last couple of minutes here, I, I, I'd like to, address a question that I hear all the time, which seems to emerge from this sort of conversation is that's a lot of information, right? And it sounds to me, you know, like the early internet days, it's like, well, yeah, it's just all this, you know, what am I going to do with all that? And the answer is you aren't, you know, you're going to do with some of that and all, you know, so just imagine that you could have all that information about software bill of materials and handling and custody and patches and threat intel and everything else. Um, which bits do you actually want? And these last use cases in the last couple of mi minutes touch on that. Because again, if you have all of the supply chain stuff in the world and you put it on a critical server that you then don't monitor and you put on a flat network with, you're still dead, right? You know, so this, all of this supply chain information plays into context where you say, I actually need that software bill of material and this type of software bill of materials and these three enhanced software bill of materials on this device because it's very expensive and critical. 
and I've put in the monitoring and I've put in the, the network architecture around it. And I, I know I actually care. You can't do that for every asset you have by definition. And you won't need to. And, and Ron's used the word attest a couple of times. And this is, you know, the, the, the you know, and for my own bias and filter, this, this, it, it all gets very simple because you're already attesting to each other. You know, Andy, you've got so many direct customers as Schneider, you have all sorts of relationships with them. You attest to each other about all sorts of things. You know, that will continue. You don't, you know, impossible things won't happen. Unisys and Schneider and, you know, OSI Soft are not going to have direct relationships with every five person company on earth. And not everybody gets everybody's IP. You know, everybody gets what they need. And we go through the process of defining that. So I'd like to jump in and circle back to Andrew's comment about um, in, in the chat about regionalism. And uh, Chris, you you mentioned it as well, but we the reality of the world we live in is that governments are disposed to um, uh, banning, banning products. Con countries of origin uh, will need to be tracked uh, and SBOM is the primary uh, or at least the leading mechanism for for tracking that. So if if for no other reason uh, than preparing for um, uh, government orders, uh, it, we really as a community need to get these S bombs built and built right away. Okay, guys, we've got about a minute and a half. So I'm going to take the opportunity to thank Eric, Ron, Brian, and Chris. Uh, for joining us. It's a massive conversation. I, I really want to put together at least a one day event on this and just invite as many smart people as I can. You know, um, I was having conversations after this solar wind thing with, with, with rail operators in the United States. And there's a few that just said, I can't speak as they were going to speak, but now I can't speak. <laughs> they said, I'm dealing with this solar winds thing, you know, and it was just, it's just shocking how many asset owners are actually dealing with, with, you know, the fallout of, of these problems that we're discussing and uh, and how few people actually, you know, in, in those asset owner roles are, are really sure what to do, you know, other than prepare for, prepare for the fallout the best way you can and uh, be able be ready to bounce back, you know? So anyway, thank you, gentlemen. Um, please stick around and I'm, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for you from the audience who can ping any one of these individuals and have a direct video or a direct chat with any of them. Um, I know they're all keen to, to talk further. Um, we're going to hear from, from uh, Jake Margolis.